Welcome to Christ Church of Fort Thomas, Kentucky. We are a congregation of the United Church of Christ, and our congregation's guiding statement is that we embrace all as we journey the way of Jesus. My name is Edward Good, and I'm pastor of this congregation, and I welcome you to this time to reflect on Scripture and our lives together this week. If you've been a participant of any of our online uh, services since the pandemic began, uh, you'll notice something very different, which is the fact that I'm wearing a tie. Um, it's probably one of the very few times that I've actually been wearing a tie. We had a funeral today for a dear man in our congregation, and the music that you heard leading into uh, the service, that flute uh, piece, Abide With Me, was played by his daughter just beautifully during the service. And then at the end of this, if you want to stay around after the uh, the message there's a piece that is uh, done by our musicians at the church which is the uh, traditional thomas dorsey piece called precious lord take my hand it was just absolutely beautiful and so wanted to share those with you today we are beginning a new series as a congregation for the remainder of the summer and into september based on what are known as the fruit of the spirit a uh, list of things in the book of galatians about uh, the ways in which we live are to live as followers of Jesus. And so we are starting with an introduction and then getting into the first of those fruit today, and that is that of love. And so our scriptures today uh, come from Galatians. It's the actual fruit of the Spirit passage from Galatians 5, beginning in verse 22. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And then from 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. And as I read this, maybe count how many times you hear the word love mentioned. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed in us in this way. God sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but God loved us and sent the Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and God's love is perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in God and God in us because God has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and we do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and we believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because God first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and yet hate their siblings, their brothers, their sisters, they are liars. For those who do not love their siblings, brothers, or sisters whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from God is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters, must love their siblings as well. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I don't know <clears throat> what word you want to call it, a coincidence, a God thing, God timing, whatever it might be. But I love it when there are these moments where something happens. It just feels like it's more than just random chance. It feels a little bit like kind of a God thing where things come together. Something like that happened about two weeks ago. Uh, two weeks ago on uh, tomorrow, I was sitting down working with things um, on this series about the fruit of the Spirit, you know, planning out some of the, the liturgy and looking at some of the scriptures and so forth, when I got my weekly email from the Heartland Conference. Now, the Heartland Conference is the one of the governing bodies above us as a local congregation within the United Church of Christ. 
Every Monday, they send out a message, and our conference minister, David Long Higgins, has a prayer that he includes in there that he's written. And so this prayer that he shared a uh, few weeks ago was exactly what we were looking at. It was called Spirit Fruit. And so I want to share that as we begin together today. And so let us pray. Loving God, ripen me. Grant me grace to love that your pulse may enliven me. Grant me your joining joy, answering the fear of the world with your radiant spirit. Grant me your peace to share in a world aching to rest from fractious fighting. Grant me your patience, grounding my soul in grace, that I may offer the same to others. Grant me your kindness for every rough edge revealed in myself and in all of your beloved. Grant me a generous spirit, trusting your resource is enough for the gift of this day you give. Grant me a flood of faithfulness, filling my heart with resolve to trust in your power in all things. Grant me your gentleness for every hard thing daring to evoke anger or fear. Grant me self-control, freeing me from the prison I so easily construct with perpetual distractions covering over the gifts you yearn to give. Yes, love, grant me grace to grow in this sustaining spirit that is you in all things, seen and unseen, and let it be more than enough for today. As I said, that prayer just spoke deeply to me several weeks ago, and I've returned to it several times since, and we're going to keep returning to it over the coming weeks. And in fact, at the end of August, uh, David uh, Long Higgins is going to be preaching on one of those, uh, the, the fruit of gentleness. And so we'll be getting to that come the end of August. So I'm excited for that. But the thing about the fruit of the Spirit there's several things that we're going to look at this morning about them in general before we get into the specifics of, of the first one, love. The first is a little bit about what's going on and when Paul writes this letter. And so we're, we're coming to the end of the letter of Galatians is where we're jumping into in Galatians chapter 5. And up to this point, it has been a rough ride. This is one of those letters that's not a warm, fuzzy letter from Paul to a church. Um, these are hard words that Paul is sharing with this group of believers. These are those this tough love kind of thing that Paul is sharing with them. In fact, there is a point in the uh, in the letter where he think at the beginning of chapter three where he says, you know, boldly, you know, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? And it's you know a way to maybe translate that for us and be like, you know, you knuckleheads, what happened? Paul is deeply concerned. He's angry. He's upset. He's saddened about the fact that these believers who were on a path uh, at one point of, of embracing the transformational work of God in their lives are beginning to slip back into old ways and old habits and old practices and, and, and in old teachings that are leading them away from what Paul had shared with them. And so Paul is writing to them and saying, what happened to you? What happened to you. I've shown you these new ways, and yet you're just going back to the old ways. And he's frustrated and he's upset. And that's where he gets to this point where we get in chapter five, he actually lists this whole list of things that he calls the, the works of the flesh and all kinds of things that he lists of, of ways of what living an old way before Jesus. He says, those are the works of the flesh. And then that's why our passage starts in contrast. In contrast, the fruit of the Spirit are love and joy and peace and patience and all the rest that we heard today. And, and so that's Paul's concern. That's why Paul is, is giving this, this message to them throughout the letter. There is the new life in Christ. Embrace the new way. Follow the new way. Don't go back to the old ways. It reminds me a little bit. I used to play tennis. I still play a little bit. haven't played very much. Uh, over the last several years, but in high school and or junior high and high school, I played tennis all the time. But one of the things that was one of my biggest struggles in tennis was my backhand. I just, I had a horrible backhand. And so I was always trying to find ways to run around the backhand so I could hit a forehand. And, and my tennis coach in junior high kept trying to be like, look, here is a new way for you to do a backhand. 
right? I was trying to do a one-handed backhand. He said, no, I think you're more of a two-handed backhand type of person. And so he kept trying to show me these ways and telling me to keep practicing it. And you know what? I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it because you know what? I was more comfortable trying to do the old way, even though the new way would have been a whole lot better for me, right? That's a kind of frustration that Paul's got with these Galatian believers. He loves them dearly, but they keep falling back to these old ways. And so that's where he comes to this list where he says, by contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and generosity and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. This list of, of nine things that, you know, when we read it, it's very tempting for us to see that list and think, okay, all right, well, these are the things that the fruit, the, the, the Spirit gives, but, you know, some of them are more me, some of them aren't so much that we look at it and then kind of pick and choose. But there's a problem with that. That these, the reality is, is these are not like what, what Paul in other parts of the letters call spiritual gifts. Um, in some of other Paul, uh, Paul's letters, he talks about that there are certain gifts given to certain people. Some people have the gift of teaching. Some people have the gift of healing. Some people have the gift of speaking in tongues. Some have the gift of administration. And there's a whole bunch of others that Paul lists out. But the thing with spiritual gifts is some people have some of them, but they don't have others, right? So not everybody has all the spiritual gifts. But these are different. And, and one of the problems we have is a problem with English. And that is that when we read this and it says the fruit of the Spirit and lists these nine things, is because of how way our English is, we read that and think, okay, well, these are all individual things. And so I might have the fruit of love, but you might have the, the, the fruit of faithfulness. But that isn't what's actually in the Bible. See, our problem in English is that the same word, fruit, is used for singular, one apple, and also for plural, for a bowl of apples and oranges and kiwis sitting on a table. So it's a bowl of fruit and a fruit in my hand, that apple. And when you look at what the original language is, the Greek here, it's a singular thing. It's not plural. It's not the fruits of the Spirit are all of these things. No, the fruit, singular, of the Spirit working in somebody's life are these nine things. Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and generosity and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. All of them are the singular fruit of the Spirit. And so what that means is that the work of God in us is to transform us into people who exhibit all of these things. That that is a sign of the Spirit really deeply working in somebody's life when all of these fruit are exhibited. Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and so forth. Now you might say, you might say, wait, 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 wait. I'm not a patient person. Now I'm a loving person, but I am not a patient person. I definitely, that's not the way that God works in me. Well, I think it's a lot more that maybe we, you have not allowed God to work on that area in your life. Because all of them, the singular fruit of the Spirit of God working in your life. And we're going to explore each of those as we go through these next several weeks. And we start, though, with the foundational one, love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. I really believe Paul put this one first on purpose. Because as you read all of what Paul shares, love is at the center. Love is at the center for him of what it means to live a life following the way of Jesus. And not just Paul, but others in the New Testament, and of course also in the teachings of Jesus. When we look at the teachings of Jesus, when Jesus was asked, what's the most important commandment? What did Jesus say? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. Essentially three loves. Love, neighbor, love God, love neighbor, as you love yourself. That's the most important thing. Not all the other 10, that's it. <laughs> Those other ones are important, 
but the most important is love. Jesus talked about that the way you exhibit love is the ways in which you sacrifice and give of yourself for other people, among many other teachings that Jesus gives on love. And then when you get into the letters, you get what we read in the, the first letter of John, this lengthy list of, of all these, these statements about love. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God. Right? That God, it's, God is essentially love itself. And that the way that we love exhibits that to the world. In the book of Acts, when it talks about how the early church was known in the world, it wasn't known by anything other than first and foremost how they loved one another. And then, of course, Paul, in a different letter, the letter to the church in Corinth in chapter 13 is one of the most famous passages in all of the Bible. If you've been to a wedding, chances are you've probably heard it. From 1 Corinthians 13 that speaks of love. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and angels, but if I don't have love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Paul's writing this at the end of a letter to this church that was deeply divided. A church that was not exhibiting love to one another. A church that was fighting amongst each other of who was the closest to God, who was the most faithful, and so forth. And they're fighting over the fact that some people exhibited the gifts of tongues, some people had the gift of knowledge, some people had the gift of faith, and they were lording it over one another. And so Paul starts off this section after a whole litany of things about what it means that they are one body together. And he says, if I speak in the tongues of mortals and angels... If I have those gifts, but if I don't have love, I'm a clanging gong. I'm an annoying, obnoxious noise. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and knowledge, like if God has given me these great wisdom uh, insights and, and, and aspects of wisdom, but if I don't have love, I am nothing. In fact, the word there is not the word nothing. It's basically trash. I'm rubbish. I'm, I'm good to be just thrown away. If, if I have all faith to move mountains, but if I don't have love, I'm nothing. If I give away everything, if I do all of this stuff, but if I don't have love, I am nothing. For Paul, love is at the center of it all. And he has this beautiful list. Love is patient, kind, not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Now, while this is often used at weddings, and it's appropriate to use at a wedding, Paul didn't write this to be used at a wedding ceremony. Paul wrote this to share with that church what it meant for them to love one another for them to love God, for them to love the world. Because this is the love of God. It is the foundational aspect of the, of the way of Jesus. It is the foundational fruit of the Spirit, the foundation of the fruit of the Spirit. And Paul ends this chapter with this statement, and now faith, hope, and love abide. Right? Three beautiful things, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. That's at the center. And that is the place for us as we start this series, as we look at what it means for us to be transformed by the Spirit of God. This is not about just getting information about what it means to love or to be patient or to be kind or to be generous. No, it's about how we allow the Spirit of God to transform us. And maybe one way to think about and reflect upon how it is we are exhibiting love is a quote that I heard a friend of mine shared this with me this week. It says simply, the test of Christianity, the test of Christianity is not loving Jesus. Let that sink in for a second. The test of Christianity is not loving Jesus. The test of Christianity is not loving Jesus, but here's the kicker, but loving Judas. The test of Christianity is not loving Jesus, but loving Judas. It's easy to love Jesus. It's really easy to love Jesus. For what Jesus teaches and says and does, he's an easy guy to love. But Judas, the one who betrayed Jesus, the one who hurt Jesus, the one who betrayed his friends, it's a lot harder to love Jesus, isn't it? Or Judas, isn't it? Yeah, that's a sign. It's a sign for us, if we can love Judas, 
we're on our way to loving as God loves. And the other Judases in our world, our enemies, those who've hurt us, who've wronged us. How can we still love? We may not be in relationship with them. We may not even like them. But how do we love them? So that's where we start with this exploration of what it means to be transformed by the Spirit of God. To exhibit the fruit, singular fruit of the Spirit of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But we start with love. How are you exhibiting that deep love in your life? Grace and peace and love and joy be with you. Amen. Precious Lord, take my hand. Oh